uh, Chairman, uh, to the Senators, thanks again uh, on behalf of the NYCI for the invitation to come to speak to you uh, on the Youth Guarantee. And I have a presentation which I think has been circulated. Um, so, um, I suppose just a little bit very quickly, uh, just about the, about the NYCI. We are a representative body for uh, over 50 organisations working uh, with young people uh, in, in, in almost every community in Ireland. We have uh, 40,000 uh, volunteers working in the youth sector in Ireland, and we have about 1,400 full-time staff equivalent. So a lot of people work on a part-time basis, but overall it's about 1,400. And a recent uh, independent assessment of the numbers of young people you know, participating in, in programmes run by youth organisations in Ireland showed there was about 382,000 young people in the 10 to 24-year-old age group. So quite a significant number of young people are engaging in our member services. And 53% of those young people were from what could be described as, as economically and socially disadvantaged areas. So that's just a brief bit about us. Um, in relation to um, the data, I suppose, just to give you a bit of a context, uh, I suppose we're all, I've no doubt the members are well aware of the issue of, of youth unemployment, but there have been some changes since the crisis first hit in the sense that the numbers of young people on the live register um, has dropped relatively significantly since, since uh, 2010 or so. Uh, it's down about, if my maths is correct, about 20, 23, 24,000. Uh, but alongside that, we've seen an increase in long-term youth unemployment. So we have uh, over uh, 30,000, the figures at the end of October 2012, we have about 30,000 young people who've been signing on the live register for 12 months or more. Um, we also know there's been significant emigration. The estimates show there's about 142,000 young people in the, 20 to 20, in, in the other 25 age cohort that have emigrated, and obviously many more uh, between 25 and, and 30. Um, and even though the numbers of young people who've been unemployed has come down, we also know that the numbers of young people in the labour force has come down. Uh, uh, the last, in 2012, it came down by about 10%, uh, or it fell by about 10%. And between 2008 and 2012, the numbers of young people under 25 in the workforce is almost halved. So I think it's just, I suppose, it's important to, to put those figures out there to state the, the level of, of, of the, the crisis that, 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 that we're facing. Um, and again, it is important to state that the level of unemployment among young people does depend on their educational qualifications. That's not a new phenomenon. It's been fairly well known for, for any, all international domestic studies have shown that young people uh, are, they do insulate themselves a little bit against unemployment, you know, based on their level of education. It's not a, uh, it's not going to protect them completely, but you can see from the figures there, the level of unemployment among young graduates was around 18%. But among young people who were educated just to primary level, it was 70%. So you can see a massive difference there. And Ireland also has the fourth highest level of young people who are in what I suppose is this needs category, which is young people not in employment, education, or training. Uh, and the Euro, uh, the Euro Fund, uh, which is I think the Founda European Foundation for the Improvement of Living and Working Conditions, they estimated that it it costs about 150 billion at a European level each year to have that level of young people not engaged uh, in, in the workforce or in training, and that would work out at about, you know, they would estimate it costs about 3 billion to, to Ireland. Um, and uh, James, my colleague from the European Youth Forum, will talk a bit more about the European dimension, but I thought in terms of the European Affairs Committee, uh, some recent statistics which I came across show that there's almost 14 million young people in Europe who are. Uh, between 15 and 29 who were not uh, in education, employment or training. And that equals to about uh, the population of seven member states. I would acknowledge the seven smallest member states, but still it, it's, it's a staggering figure to think that there's 14 million across Europe. Um, to get on to, I suppose, the primary question that you've, 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 you've asked us, I suppose just in relation to the issue of education and training, um, uh, you know, we would be very clearly of the view that there has been an increase to a certain extent, there in some of the existing schemes, and there also has been some new initiatives, obviously, such as Springboard, Momentum, and obviously Jobbridge. But overall, our assessment would be that there is definitely not enough uh, places and opportunities to, to meet the demand. Uh, I recently, just a few weeks ago, one of our member, affiliate of one of our member organisations down in Tipperary was having a meeting to recruit 20 young people uh, to go on a training course, and 120 young people turned up. So, you know, the challenge that they face in that community trying to deal with that. A lot of the, you know, Dermot would know more than I, but I think there are certainly a lot of youth reach centres that have, you know, long waiting lists 
uh, again, and so the, the, the lack of capacity is an issue there. And we're particularly concerned about the young people who have the lowest level of, of educational qualifications, maybe have other issues, uh, maybe have lack of parental support, maybe had a bad experience in school, we're concerned that they're kind of been pushed to the back of the queue because there has been such an increase in unemployment and such demand for courses. Those young people who have uh, greater access, get greater resources, will get a lot of the places, which is important, but young people who actually probably need it even most actually are, are probably less likely to get, get on the schemes. And certainly we did some analysis of some of the existing government programmes and it, it's striking actually that the numbers of young people who are long-term unemployed on some of the programmes is very low, and that would be a worry for us. So I think there would need to be some, some, uh, so, some efforts put there. And as I mentioned, youth reach, uh, certainly doing a lot of excellent work, but as far as I'm aware, the actual capacity in youth reach has not been increased significantly since the crisis happened, and, and that, that is a problem. We'd also be concerned about the quality of some of the, the, the course, other programmes, some of the courses, there is a lot of very good work being done, but there also there might be some courses which we feel or some training opportunities which uh, are short term, maybe not very well targeted. It's not really clear if young people are getting um, great value from them and if they're going to progress them into education or, or into employment. And so there is that question of we are spending significant resources, but are those resources been spent spent well? Um, in relation to youth guarantee, uh, we strongly welcome uh, the the. The proposal, and we certainly welcome the decision of the European Council of Social Affairs ministers last month to to to, to agree it and, and compliment, I suppose, the Irish government for having done that. Um, but um, and, and we were among the first organisations in Ireland, I think, to call for for the youth guarantee and call for it to be, be be implemented here in Ireland. But the idea is a good one. I think the issue is one around how it's implemented uh, and how it actually works in practice. And for us, the three key issues are funding, uh, quality and progression, and then reaching uh, and supporting the most disadvantaged young people uh, uh, in Ireland. Um, on, the on the funding, um, the, 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 IRA, the International Labour Organization did an analysis of the, uh, of the youth guarantee which operates in Sweden, and I think their analysis was, was at a cost of about 6,600 6, 6, per participant. Um, now, obviously, we can't take a, a scheme from another European jurisdiction and kind of plant it in Ireland and say it would be the same here. Uh, but I think uh, I would say in relation to engaging with the most disadvantaged young people, I think that figure would be very low. But likewise, maybe with some young people who might need limited support, that figure could be very high. But, for example, if you were to uh, take that figure of 6,600 um, and apply it to Ireland and just say we're going to engage with those young people who are unemployed for 12 months or more, you would be looking at an annual bill of about 200 million. But we would argue that's money well spent because the cost of actually leaving that cohort of young people not engaged on the live register is actually going to cost us more in the long run. So the six billion that has been agreed by the European Union... That's about 35,000 young people, is that what you make it out? Uh, Long-term unemployed is yeah. 30,000 right. young people, yeah. Okay. Um, so the six billion is, is very welcome, and maybe I'll leave James's more expertise in relation to, to that issue, so I'll leave that to him. But I think there is an issue about the Irish government will have to provide matching funding, and uh, where you know that is something that we need to address. I don't think the idea that somehow all this money is going to come from Europe is something that we, you know, there, there, there seems to be some, I think sometimes there seems to be that sense that that it all is going to come from Europe, and we know that's not the case. But I think Ireland is in a very strong position to draw down significant resources from this fund. There is an issue as well, I suppose, that we would put on the table. Uh, the private sector does benefit from the education training of young people, and there are many sectors of the economy where actually we actually have vacancies. Um, and there is a question there whether or not the private sector could, could contribute as well. Um, but it's very clear there's a lack of capacity. So in the morning, if the government decided to implement a youth guarantee, you know, we just don't have the, the training places, the education places, we don't have the work experience places. I'm not saying it can't be ramped up over time, but we certainly need to look at that. And we also would say that there's, uh, I think one of the issues that we would identify is that there hasn't been, um, we do need a national emphasis, but we also need to engage with groups at local level. And I'm sure all the deputies and senators are well aware of 
great work that's been done at local level, and I think we, we could certainly engage with the community and voluntary sector to deliver some of these places as well, as well as ramping up uh, schemes like Youth Reach and others. Um, in relation to quality and progression, I think it is important that we um, just don't increase the number of places. Uh, for the sake of it, we definitely need to make sure that young people benefit from it, and particularly some of the more young people who've had maybe a bad experience of the education system, maybe have other issues, might need longer term supports uh, to enable them to get the benefit from education and training. Some young people may have literacy issues, some young people may have addiction issues, um, and certainly we would be of the view that, that we need to, to, to do more in that regard. And we don't want to have a situation where a young person goes through uh, a youth guarantee process and ends up in a job, uh, a part-time job or a temporary job on very low pay because they're going to end up back in, on the live registry in, in a short period of time in, in, in our sense. Um, so essentially I think we now need a lot of efforts here in Ireland to look at how we can implement this in, in the best way possible and make use of, of the resources. There would also be I suppose, a concern that in the UK they introduce what's called a payments by results model. I know the Irish government are talking about bringing in uh, people, uh, third parties, the private sector, into the whole activation uh, system. And I suppose in the UK, as far as I'm aware, the payments by results model was that you were given a cohort of people to get off, the li off their live register and move them into employment, and you were paid on the percentage of those you got into, the, into employment. Um, but some of those people were progressed into not very satisfactory employment. And also there's a tendency to cherry pick those people who already are quite close to the labour market and would need legally support. So I think we'd have to look at that very, very, very carefully. And finally, Chairman, um, I'm conscious that uh, we only have five minutes, but yeah, we, we think there is a need uh, to concentrate primarily on the most disadvantaged young people. We don't want to, four or five years into the crisis, I suppose you, you could argue that we are kind of getting into that scenario, but we don't want to create the problem that we had in the, the, the 80s and the 90s where we created a, a cohort of people who were very long-term unemployed who needed a lot of support to get back into the, into the labour force. And we particularly would kind of ask that, you know, emphasis is given to the long-term unemployed, particularly the 30,000 who've been unemployed for a year or more, the 17,000 who have been unemployed for, for two years, they need particular focus. And the youth guarantee in Sweden and Finland, uh, which has been quite successful, it wasn't as successful with this cohort. And we do believe that, um, that the youth sector, the organisations that we represent, who are working with young people who have credibility in the communities, could play a role. We have already spoken to uh, government in relation to that, uh, in terms of putting proposals on the table. That some of the money coming for the youth guarantee would be given, would be designated to address the, the hardest to reach, the most disadvantaged young people. And because if it's not, I think there is a danger from our point of view that they once again would be marginalised and, and left behind. But I'll leave it there and I'm happy to answer questions later on. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you very much, James. Uh, James Higgins from the European Youth Forum. Would you yeah. like to go next? Yeah, thanks Great. very much, Thank uh, Chairman. I'm very happy to be here and to add a little bit more of a, a European context onto the debate so far. Um, as, as you already mentioned, uh, on the 20th of February, the, the EPSCO Council uh, approved our recommendation for the Youth Guarantee, which was following directly up on the European Commission's proposal as part of their uh, Youth Employment Package at the end of last year. Um, and the, the Council recommended that, that Member States start to implement this scheme as soon as possible, preferably uh, from, from the start of 2014. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a, of a rationale um, behind the scheme, as James already mentioned, it is based on a, on a Nordic model uh, of early labour market activation measures that, that really have, have been in operation in some way since the 1980s. Um, in Sweden, they first brought in the, the job guarantee as a term of their 1984, and it was shortly followed by, by other Scandinavian countries and then by, by Finland. Um, there's been many reworkings of these schemes over subsequently since they were first brought in, uh, and there's a lot that, that that European member states can, can learn from, from the way that they've had to adopt and change the schemes in order to adapt to the way that the labour market has changed, um, specifically in, in relation to young people. With regards to the Commission's proposal that came out, uh, a very significant part of it was that uh, youth organisations and the representatives of young people should be involved in the design and implementation of the schemes. 
And the reason for this, as, as James mentioned, is that it's very difficult, unfortunately, to, to reach uh, long-term unemployed uh, young people uh, because of some of the issues of, of social exclusion that they might have. And it requires uh, often civil society organisations um, to do that. The big advantage of the youth guarantee uh, from the, the way that it's been implemented in the Nordic model is that it does prevent the onset of uh, long-term unemployment when it is implemented correctly. Unfortunately, statistics show that long-term unemployment is growing in Europe as a whole. It has increased 3.7% uh, since 2008 um, and is increasing at a rate that's higher than the adult rate of long-term unemployment, which is almost uh, unheard of, considering that young people usually don't fall into long-term unemployment in the same way that, that, that older people do. Um, to, to go into a little bit on, uh, on the way that it has been implemented in Sweden and in Denmark, as, as James mentioned, it costs around €6,600 per participant uh, in the Swedish model. And there is a, a large popularity um, in the scheme in Sweden. Uh, from 2000, in 2008, about 10,000 young people were participating in this scheme in Sweden, and it's currently at 53,000 uh, people participating. It has to be noted that the implementation of the Youth Guarantee in the short term does put a large strain on, on public employment services, and there has to be a reorientation of public employment services in some ways towards the, the uptake from young people. And to give you an example of that, in, um, in, in 2009 in Finland, uh, due to an increased demand from young people, there was only about one uh, youth advisor for every 700 young people participating in the scheme. And they had to therefore radically invest further in the scheme, uh, which, which had quite a lot of success. Uh, in 2010, they, they put more public expenditure towards it, and there was a successful intervention for 83.5% of young people participating, meaning, meaning that they got some form of training or a job uh, within the three months that they have it in Finland. Um, but although, I mean, a lot can be said about, about how much it costs, one of the reasons that it's remained popular in the Nordic countries is that in a medium to long term, it not only saves money, um, but there's actually a net profitability in this scheme per participant. So uh, as James already mentioned, it is 6,600 um, for, for young people roughly. Um, but they found out in, in a report in Sweden produced in 2010, the state tends to recuperate uh, the amount of money that they invested within one year. And after a one-year um, period, the average net gain per participant in the scheme is just over €4,000. Um, so although there is a short-term investment, there is a long-term gain, especially in preventing uh, young people from falling into to long-term unemployment, and I've, only, I've, I've already probably gone over my five minutes. I'll just, I'll just finish with a, a brief note on the funding for the scheme at a European level. Um, six billion euros has been, has been earmarked uh, by, the, by the European Union under the MFF for the scheme over a six-year period, based on the 21 billion recommended by the ILO, uh, which equates to about 0.5% of Eurozone expenditure. Even if this amount of money was matched by the member states, it would still be insufficient to implement the scheme fully. Uh, and as we've seen from the way it's been implemented before, if there's not enough investment, often the services can become overburdened um, and, and the scheme can't, can't work to the same extent. So I'll, I'll leave it there before I go on for too long. Thanks very much, James. It's very interesting. And now, uh, Dermot Stokes. Thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> I was thinking as I was, I was listening there that uh, I'm probably one of the few people remaining uh, standing who can remember the uh, social guarantee which was introduced in uh, 1984 here, uh, 30 years ago, which you, you refer to the Nordic. <laughs> you remember too. We remember. Right. <laughs> um, but uh, I think a very important thing, uh, thinking back about the experience of that measure, was that it acted as a, as a uh, trigger, or as a kind of, if you like, a fundamental aim to help direct uh, funding from the European Social Fund. And uh, in Ireland, it led to the establishment of community training centres, uh, subsequently the Youth Reach programme, and uh, PLCs, for initially as VPT. So it, it actually was, it, it became the trigger or the driver of quite substantial uh, system change. And I think it's important to, to, to bear that in, in mind. Um, uh, I, I've uh, 
now, now retired from active service, as it were, and, uh, but I've been doing a study for the OECD on local youth employment strategies, and I'm bringing some of the uh, encounters that uh, came up in that to this uh, discussion. Uh, so I want to start by saying youth is changing. Uh, 1984, when the, youth gar uh, the social guarantee was uh, around the place, the transition between school and employment, between youth and independent adulthood, was a fairly straightforward, relatively speaking, short uh, uh, experience. Uh, now, uh, a generation later, youth begins earlier, physical, you know, puberty is, is achieved earlier, independent uh, adult uh, status is achieved later. So adolescence per se has actually stretched out now between 12 and 25, and some people would say even later in terms of use like emerging adulthood uh, and to cover this, this extended and quite complex uh, process. And it's important to understand that because we may think that uh, helping young people to find a stable place in the labour market is a simple exercise, but in the modern context, actually, that's not the case. Uh, work also is, is changing, and, um, you know, in a scenario where young people have greater capacity to communicate, much greater personal freedom, uh, there's also much less structure, and much less uh, predictability, uh, and uh, jobs are much shorter. I mean, you know all of this, uh, these changes. But they have a huge impact on how services conceive the idea of jobs and the transitions. Uh, we have increased mobility. The crisis has eroded the shield that qualifications have given. Uh, now we have uh, youth, young, unemployed young people who have degrees. That was not the case uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago. A degree was a pretty good uh, shield against uh, unemployment. Uh, you also have significant levels of underemployment. Uh, and young people doing part-time employment, there was an enormous increase in that form of employment. Uh, so the guarantee isn't just a matter of uh, switching on somebody who's stuck. It's a much more complex uh, process. Uh, and looking at the Irish uh, situation, you know, we are engaged in a major and extremely ambitious reform program in relation to uh, employment services, uh, in relation to education and training structures and provision, and in relation to local uh, government. And, and these are, these are the enormous things to be attempting, while at the same time also trying to deal with a very complex issue uh, such as uh, youth uh, employment and youth unemployment. Uh, it is the case that there is no youth employment strategy. Uh, there's, there's a series you can infer one from what is there, but there isn't uh, such a strategy. The Irish education and training system, uh, you know, it is socially reproductive. We have to acknowledge that. There's high levels of retention, which is uh, unusual in the European context. More people staying to leaving certificate, but a lot of that may be parking, or people have no alternative. We have very late vocational choice in Ireland, which is unusual in the European uh, context. Uh, and that includes vocational choices in higher education. Uh, in vocational education and training, we have an extremely sophisticated and effective uh, framework for development in the National Framework of Qualifications. However, uh, that isn't necessarily mirrored in the cohesion of the vocational and education and training system. We have a very small apprenticeship system. Vocational education has a very low status relative to higher education and, and secondary education, uh, and uh, so on. So, so we've, we have a, a, a we're quite different to many other European uh, countries. Um, there are major issues to do with pathways for young people. And in countries where the uh, social, where the youth guarantee has been effective, they tend to have stronger vocational pathways, greater clarity uh, structures. The German system, the dual system, is quite determinant uh, as a system. Uh, we have a virtually open choice uh, laissez-faire system, uh, and. It, where you don't have strong vocational pathways, you do need to place a greater emphasis on guidance. Uh, and in Ireland, you could do on a page a set of uh, guidance measures. There's virtually no cohesion across the board, a very wide range of uh, guidance issues. James has already mentioned disadvantage, and I mean, I, I just endorse everything that he said there. But when you talk to employers, there are other issues to come out to do with the education and training system. They're very pertinent to the context of a youth guarantee. For example, the mismatch 
issue. Uh, employers will tell you that they are not encountering people with the qualifications that they require. There are people who are coming out who are qualified, but the qualifications that they want uh, aren't being found. So in other words, they advertise a job, get lots of applications, but the applications don't represent the job that they're actually uh, trying to fill. Uh, we also uh, are not producing an appropriate balance of intermediate skills. And if you talk to employers, for example, in uh, the uh, call centres or in the hotels and catering uh, area or in, you know, in hospitality, in retail, uh, they will tell you that they're not encountering people with the skills that they require. Uh, to, you know, but they have jobs, but they can't fill them. And very often they have to import as talent, to use the, the, the term. Uh, we may also be producing uh, a, a large numbers of people with qualifications in ICT, but when you talk to employers again, the particular qualifications aren't the ones that are actually required by employers. So lots of web designers. We don't actually need that many web designers. We need people with other uh, IT uh, skills. Migration is an issue that, and that James mentioned, but also we must remember that a couple of things about that. Uh, we have people leaving, uh, emigrating who are not Irish. Uh, we have people immigrating at the same time. So we have actually an immigration and uh, emigration uh, scenario. And uh, some of those who are, as you've, your research uh, found, mm -hmm. some of those who are emigrating have jobs. They're moving uh, to, to other jurisdictions. But Mary Kill Martin in, in uh, Maynooth uh, did a study of this. And her view is that, that it's too early to draw absolute conclusions about this. We may actually be seeing uh, uh, an extended uh, form of the gap year kind of uh, migration uh, where young people are instead of staying in Ireland in, in a low status job they may be going and traveling the world but they may actually not have committed to not coming back if you know what I mean. Um, so uh, just to, 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 to focus in quickly on a couple of issues to do with the youth guarantee Taking all that on board, there is a question. You know, there are a number of questions. One is: Is it a quick fix for uh, the current crisis, or is it the trigger for systematic change? My view is that it should be the trigger for system change. It should be a longer term, even though there is an immediate crisis. It's important to think to take a, a longer view as well as as understanding the immediacy of the crisis. Uh, question is: Is the live register the gateway to the youth guarantee? Because uh, as we know, many young people are not on the live register. In fact, the numbers. Uh, figures released a couple of days ago show that the numbers have decreased on the live register. So if that's the case, then we have, a, we have an issue because you have to start getting all young people on the live register. But of course, that in itself creates another potentially uh, significant political problem because the numbers appear to be going up, even though it's not necessarily indicative of any substantive change in the employment uh, scenario. Uh, there is uh, in the public, in, in, in Intrio and, and, and the, the new converged employment service, there is an issue to do with caseloads. Uh, people have increased caseloads. They're also expected to meet with clients three times more frequently than was the case in the past. Uh, once you get into caseloads, uh, you are at risk of people trying to move people in and out quickly off the system, as, as uh, James was uh, saying. There are issues to do with the personal plans and the profiles. Uh, IBEC, uh, for example, have questioned quite the, the, whether or not the, the personal plan model is uh, appropriate without it being embedded in a deeper uh, guidance model. And uh, this is something which we have to address. Um, the the uh, employment options uh, was raised. There's, of course, are there enough jobs? If there aren't enough jobs, what then? Education and training options, are they suitable to the local employment context? Are they suitable to the needs of the individuals who are coming through? Uh, we would certainly have a, a look travelling around the country with the, uh, the OECD lead team. We certainly were impressed by social enterprise uh, models which we encountered as an alternative to employment. The point being that you're maintaining that, uh, and again, to, to go back to what James is saying about the need to keep people uh, off, out of long-term unemployment, to keep the engine of employment uh, uh, running. But there is a series of, uh, of things, then quality. Sorry, I mean, it, the quality of what you get in, under some kind of program, uh, a short term program, must be equivalent to the quality that you would get uh, across the board. Quality is a major issue. Evaluation, uh, very important that it is consistent uh, and based on good quality data. Um, we must remember also that there are structural and cyclical issues here. Uh, certain things like early school leaving, that's a structural problem. 
All uh, uh, European Union member states, all OECD states, have early school leaving. In good times and in bad, when the uh, systems are operating at the full uh, optimum level, as well as when things are, are bad. So you need structural responses to structural problems, and cyclical responses to cyclical problems. It becomes quite an awkward uh, uh, issue, because you may well be asking the private sector providers to come in and do short-term contracts to provide for extra groups. And that then begs a whole range of questions about supervision and evaluation and monitoring and so on. For example, the Utrecht program, uh, the, uh, there's a quality framework there where the inspectors provide the external evaluation. Inspectors from the Department of Education publish their evaluations on an ongoing basis in the same way as they would for schools. It's a perfectly open, transparent and rigorous quality uh, system. There's a, uh, also a quality system in the youth sector. Well, anybody who's been commissioned to do work with young people, not from those sectors, needs to be able to satisfy the same kind of rigorous uh, quality standards. And overall, I think that there's another question, uh, finally, which is to do with system animation uh, and take, connecting up the bits of the system. And, you know, it's cohesion and communication. And uh, when uh, IBEC did a study of employers who were um, using the different uh, employer supports and incentives to take on people. Uh, the significant numbers of employers didn't know about the incentives. Uh, we met with groups of employers, large, small and, medi uh, and medium uh, employers, who said that uh, incentives were suited to very large employers but not to small employers. And Many of them said that they didn't hear, they hadn't heard about them and so on. And I have the figures which I, I can make available uh, on that. And I think it's really important that we communicate what's the youth guarantee about, what are we trying to, do to, to achieve, and if there are incentives, and the government has, has recently changed the incentives exactly as, as uh, uh, would have been recommended by the employers and by the um, expert uh, advice, uh, but it's important that employers know about this. You know, it's important that this, that this is not simply um, a mechanism to move people off the live register, but rather that it's something which is changing the system and which is part of a wider uh, dialogue or discourse about employment and about employment generation and about economic uh, regeneration. Thank you very much, Stuart. Now, the first person questioning is Senator Catherine. Uh, thanks very much. First of all, I was